the bar with your friends, you're having a drink, you're having a laugh, you're having a good time. And at some point, you look across the bar and you see a cute girl or a cute boy that you would like to get to know. And you're checking them out. You're trying to evaluate their style, you know, what they look like. Do they have a boyfriend or a girlfriend? You know, what kind of people do they look like? Should I say this? Should I say that? Should I buy them a drink? And you're making all these plans in your head and trying to evaluate what is the best thing for you to do. And by the time you make a decision, you've missed your chance. She or he went home. And this is how we sabotage our lives with one bad habit. Think before you act. There's so much emphasis in everyday life in thinking, thinking, thinking before we act. And just like in the situation in the bar, also in business we tend to do that a lot. We sit behind a laptop, we plan, we Google, we Google for statistics, we consult experts, we make beautiful boards with post-it notes, we Google some more, we make growth plans, marketing plans, social media plans, so we can get ready to execute. And there's two possible scenarios that can come out of this. First one is that you have this big, amazing, beautiful plan that is completely overwhelming. You don't know where to start, you don't have the resources to do it, you don't have the people, you don't have the money, you don't have the time to execute the plan. And after some weeks of thinking about it and feeling overwhelmed, you decide to not move forward. This is what we call paralysis by analysis. The second scenario is that you have this big, amazing, beautiful plan and you spring into action. And you start working on your plan and then after a week or two, there's an unexpected challenge that comes this way. You deal with it, you fix it, then you go back to working on your plan. And there's another challenge, completely unexpected, from another side. And you start spending your time between putting out unexpected fires and trying to get to your plan. And your plan, all these unexpected fires are, has happened because your plan is not very realistic. It was conceived in theory. So either you waste all your resources trying to fight the fires and try to execute this theoretical plan uh, until the project dies, or you become overwhelmed and you kill it yourself. The point that I'm trying to make is that when we evaluate situations based on theory, it's all theory. There's a long leap from theory to reality, and reality is where success is. It's not in theory. We need to do things to succeed in things. And there's a Swedish habit that produces very good results with uh, quite good consistency. But before we go into what this habit is, I want us to look a bit at the success of Sweden to understand why we should consider adopting this habit. Sweden is a small country by population, just under 10 million people, a little bit bigger than New York City or London, yet it has created some of the biggest successes across the world and across different fields. You have some of the biggest companies in the world that come from Sweden, some of the biggest personalities across different fields that come from Sweden, and of course, uh, the country is considered a model society for people on the planet. So I've put together a brief list. This is by no means exhausting. Uh, everything you see there, everyone you see there is Swedish. The musicians, I want to emphasize a bit on the lower left corner where we have Britney Spears, Backstreet Boys, Taylor Swift. They're not Swedish, but the music producers behind the, their greatest hits are Swedish. You have traditional companies like Tetra Pak, H&M, Electrolux. You have your startup unicorns like Spotify, Skype, Klarna. All the successful individuals, PewDiePie on YouTube, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, the football player, Alfred Nobel. Uh, Magnus Nilsson, the chef. Ingmar Bergman, the director. This list is long, 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 long. With the most recent export, if I may, from Sweden being uh, Greta Thunberg who is a 16-year-old climate change warrior. She's been active publicly for the last 10 months, and she's done more for raising a voice for climate change than any other public figure has ever done. 16 years old. 
And of course, we have social welfare, immigration. Sweden is a leading voice when it comes to uh, feminism, the environment, and animal welfare. And the truth is that before I moved to Sweden, I did know about most of these companies and most of these people, but I didn't know that they came from Sweden. And Sweden is a big mystery box for one very simple reason. Please raise your hand if there's anyone here who speaks Swedish. No? Anyone wants to learn Swedish in the future? Raise your hand. All right, we got one, two people, maybe a two or three in the back. All right, very nice. So you understand that if the only people speaking, speaking Swedish today are the people who live in Sweden and the Swedes, it's very hard to get into their minds and understand what's happening and how they deal with life. I've been living in Sweden and working there for almost a decade now. I run a food tech company. So what did I learn? I already knew that you cannot control the results, but I learned that you can control the process and the habits that lead to the results. And better habits will almost certainly lead to better results. It's impossible to know what the right things to do are. And that's why it's very important that we understand uh, that we need to learn what the wrong things to do are, what we should not do. Thomas Edison famously said, I have not failed, I just found 10,000 ways that don't work. The Swedes say, Jorom Joret, which loosely translated means, do it again so you can make it right. And the process, this habit goes something like this. You take whatever idea you have and you strip it completely of all the bells and whistles, all the technology. And it's very important to strip it enough that you're embarrassed to put it out in the world. If you're proud about the idea that you're putting out in the world, you've worked on it too much. You need to be a little bit embarrassed about what you've done. You launch it into the world, you see how people react, you observe, you keep notes, you learn, you take those learnings and apply them back to the idea. This way you minimize thinking, you minimize guessing, you minimize your risk, and you maximize doing and learning, therefore maximizing your success rate. So it's a little bit difficult to understand how this works uh, in a vacuum. So what I want to do is start a project with you right here, right now, to put it into action and see how you can apply it. So let's assume you are a person like me that pays for a gym membership but never really goes to the gym. And uh, you see there's other people around you that have the same habit. They pay for the gym but they rarely go. You decide it's interesting, so you Google a little bit and you figure out that universally about 67% of gym members never go to the gym. There's half a billion pounds wasted in the UK, about $2 billion in the US, you think there's an opportunity here to help people stop wasting your money. So you have this idea that you're going to make this app that's going to send reminders and motivational quotes to people so you can convince them to go to the gym and therefore take advantage of uh, the monthly subscription they're paying. So if you think that you should start designing your app or coding if you're a developer, uh, in my opinion, that's the wrong way to start. What I think you should do is this. Find five random people that fit this profile. That pay for the gym, but don't go. Not your friends, not your family, random people. Try to convince them to take part in a little experiment. If you can't convince them, you go home, you fix your pitch, and you try again. Once you have them convinced, you're going to tell them this is what's going to happen. You're going to receive uh, every week some reminders, some motivational quotes, to encourage you to go to the gym more often, and uh, my system is going to adapt accordingly. If you go, if you start going to the gym, they start sending you less notification. If you're not going to the gym, the system is going to adapt and provide you relevant information. You ask them a few basic questions. How long have you been paying for the gym? How much do you pay? How often do you actually go to the gym? And how often would you like to go? So now you have a benchmark. What these people don't know is that you have zero technology. The only technology you're going to use is SMS. So once you get their phone numbers and they agree to participate in this experiment, let's say, for four weeks, 
you're going to send them every day reminders, or pack your bag so you can go to the gym tomorrow. You send them a motivational quote from, I don't know, Arnold Schwarzenegger or something. You test different ideas, and you see if their attendance uh, improves. Now, some of you might think, how do I know if they actually go to the gym? How do I know if their attendance improves? I don't have an app that can track their location. Very simple. Ask them to send you a selfie. Ask them to send a selfie like this, with their finger on their nose so you know it's not an old selfie from the gym, you know, trying to trick you. So you run this test for like three, four weeks, and you start learning. And I'm going to take a bad case scenario here to see what happens. Let's say their attendance did not improve, same day reminders didn't work, in general they don't work at all, and in fact your reminders are frustrating them because you're reminding them that they're paying for something that they, that they kind of want to do, but they kind of don't want to do, and it's a mess. And you're like this, what now? Uh, I see three possible scenarios from here on. Scenario number one, you continue your testing, you start testing different ideas, maybe different kinds of motivational quotes. Maybe you skip motivational quotes, you send them, I don't know, a GIF, a YouTube video, something. You start testing different ideas, to see if they work, if they improve uh, their attendance. And you react accordingly. Second scenario is, if you can't figure out other things that you can test, maybe you try to pivot your idea, and that means to change the direction, flip it on its head. So, for example, if you cannot convince them to go to the gym, your initial intention was to help them uh, to stop wasting money. Maybe now you can convince them to quit the gym, right? That's a completely opposite approach, but it's something you can test if you would like. A third scenario is that you stop everything and you continue with your life. You don't have any other ideas that you want to test, that you can test. Uh, what has happened is you spent four weeks, no technology, no money, very easily you tested some essentials. Is it stupid? Yes. It's very stupid, but it's important to understand that's it not, that it's not more stupid than spending weeks or even months designing and developing an app together with your partners or alone, only to launch it after six months or a year and see it fail for the most basic reasons that you could have found in just a few weeks with SMS. 99% of the time when you start something, Challenges are going to come from where you least expect it. And that's why I want to talk a little bit about feelings and bust some myths about success. So it's scary. You have an idea, you have your baby, it's your passion, and then you have a guy like me uh, telling you, put it out there. Make it ugly, make it inexpensive, don't be proud, put out something that's a little bit embarrassing. And it's scary, because it's not fair to your idea, it's not fair to your baby. And that's fine, but we need to understand that our brains are wired to always choose comfort and safety over uncomfortable situation. Your uh, brain is always going to try to find excuses so you don't do what scares you. And that's why I want to talk about this. You need to be courageous to do this, but there is this misconception that courage is about risk. Courage has nothing to do with risk. Courage is about uncovering your weaknesses. When you put yourself out there, when you put your idea out there, it's like bait. You're, you're trying to learn things that you didn't know you could learn. You need to let your weaknesses, your ideas, weaknesses, bring it down so they can uncover themselves, so you can fix them, so you can control them. Otherwise, they will control you. For me, after working with this uh, process for quite some time, it feels more scary not to do that. It feels more scary to sit behind a desk, plan, 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 and then take a risk and execute. Similarly about success. Success is not about taking risks. Success is about finding a sustainable way to help people with your product, with your service, with your organization, while you're still making money for your organization, for profit or not for profit, that's up to you. Basically, taking away all the risk. You need to test to find out what doesn't work so you can figure out what does work. 
It's actually more risky, if I can use the example from before, to build your app for six months, one year, put all your money, all your time, all your passion into it, put it out there, and see it fail. That's a gamble. Last but definitely not least, success is the opposite of failure. That could not be more wrong. Failure has nothing to do with winning or losing. Failure has to do with learning. Again, you put your ideas out there, step one fails, no problem. We learn something. We learn that this doesn't work. Let's do it a different way. And if you understand and internalize and process a bit in your mind uh, these three things, I think it will help you to take that step. But if it still doesn't help, there's one question you can ask yourself. What's the worst thing that could happen? And if the answer does not cause harm to yourself or others around you, it's probably not a big deal. You should probably do it. So coming to an end here, I want to recap a little bit and provide some context. First, you need to find your North Star. What is it that you want to be, that you want to achieve in 10, 20, 30 years from today? You want to be a millionaire. You want to help all the disadvantaged people in your community or in your country. Maybe you want to have the best restaurant in the country. Anything you want. You need to have a North Star. And the reason is because from where you are today until you achieve that goal, it's never going to be a straight line. You're going to have to go, of course, but you need that Northern Star to guide you. Second point, plan small. Don't plan big elephants that are going to overwhelm you and paralyze you. If you're starting something now, whether it's a new business or a project within your company, plan for the next two or three months. You don't know what's going to happen after three months. In three months, you will evaluate the situation and make a slightly bigger plan for the next four, five, or six months. And keep going like this. Third, and the core of this talk, is about your idea. Strip it, launch something into the world that is maybe a little embarrassing. Learn, observe, keep notes, apply what you've learned, and repeat. Fourth point, make it a habit. Much like going to the gym, if you go once to the gym, okay. If you go twice, all right, a little bit better. But if you can go twice a week, week after week, month after month, only then will you start seeing the benefits of going to the gym. Similar with this. You can't expect to do it one time to get it right and to get results. You need to do it repeatedly. Fifth, if you feel scared, ask yourself, what's the worst thing that could happen? So, in conclusion, if you want to get the girl or the boy at the bar, if you want to increase your success rate, if you want to turn as the theme of this TED Talk is uh, chaos into color, try to do it like, like the Swedes. I hope I managed to convince you to give it a shot, and I can promise you it's worth it. You will learn something.